fire. It has warmed our homes and run our industries. However, there is another side to this most ancient of man's associations. Fire's potential for uncontrolled spread has always been a part of the history of Grey Highlands. All too often it has taken lives and destroyed what we've built. It has also forged our resolve and our ability to work together to control it. Much of the history of fire and firefighting in Grey Highlands happened here at these four corners. This is the main intersection of the village of Flesherton, founded in 1847. These buildings here on the northeast corner are standing on the ruins of what was once the Spruill Block, a two-story wooden structure totally destroyed by fire in 1908. This is the northwest corner. Built in 1880, this Second Empire-style solid brick building was originally Richardson's department store. The three-story main store still stands, but the two-story annex, which housed a harness shop, the Standard Bank and the Township Clerk's Office, was destroyed by fire on December 30th, 1905. Flesherton's post office now occupies the site where the annex used to be. The post office is built against this solid triple brick wall. This wall is the only reason that the three-story building behind me did not catch on fire when the attached two-story harness shop burned to the ground. Welcome to Munshaw House Inn, a famous landmark on the southeast corner. Munshaw's was a coaching inn that prided itself on a spacious livery stable. The stable burned to the ground in the 1920s. Across the street on the southwest corner stood the Fawcett Furniture Store and Funeral Home. It burned down in April 1970. It was a frequent occurrence for fires to happen more than once. The Jameson brothers have for the third time had their sawmill burn. This time with a total loss and no insurance. They were so anxious to get back into business and keep going and that's the way they knew how to do things. So they just continued in their habits until they would realize that you know, they keep doing the same thing over and over again, it comes as the same result. Even if they rebuilt a brick, if they've still got all of those flammable materials on site or they're still doing hazardous activities with open fire, they didn't change the use. And if it was the use that caused the first fire, the use could cause another fire. And quite honestly, the, the fire investigation techniques that were back then, a fire happened, they didn't sometimes look at the, the reason the fire happened, what all contributed to the fire happening. The fires in towns were caused by having a lot of things that were flammable and by having a lot of buildings in proximity. The chimneys weren't uh, double insulated chimneys. They were just single chimneys going through wood walls and wood floors. A lot of them didn't even have a, fin a protective finish on them. They'd have been all dried out and weathered. Quite often the sparks and stuff will jump onto the roofs and shingles and things will catch. Quite often there are cedar shakes and things like that and they just go up like nothing. So a fire would, would go quickly from one building to the next building without being able to stop it. Farm families faced unique potential hazards. A barn fire after harvest could ruin a family. Basically, uh, a farm is like a, an industry, and the farm owner is like a jack of all trades that runs that industry. If it's involved in the barn, that, that's the livelihood for the farmer. And it's very difficult to put barn fires out. In the earlier days, hay was stored, stored in the barns. And any farmer will tell you, if you don't put your hay, hay away perfectly dry, you can have, uh, it just self-combusts. And silo fires are common even today because of hay or silage. A small fire would get out of control uh, totally uh, instantly. 
and you see it at house fires too, but you can just see it in the in the farmer's face, like it's just like everything I worked for, you know, everything I had is gone. You know, if if maybe he's a third generation farmer, as an example, you know, and he just it's probably in the back of his mind, you know, I've I lost everything that my grandfather worked for, my grandmother and mm -hmm. Fire insurance was available, but it was seldom enough to cover losses. W.J. Talbot's barn was burned to the ground. This season's crop and about 400 bushels of old grain lost. Insurance coverage of only $1,300. Between 1876 and 1910, fire insurance maps like these were used by insurance companies to set their rates. Fire risk is very much associated to the purposes of a property. The easiest way to explain it is to maybe show you, and uh, this is the fire map of Flesherton. And uh, so here's the four corners. And in order to understand the map, you have to read the key, which is fairly complicated. Uh, but it's color-coded, and they could look at the map, they could see what a building was built of. So, uh, any of the commercial buildings, it describes what the building was used for. This map stated in 1894, uh, and it tells what the water sources were for putting out a fire. So that would be used to establish a basic rate. We're not talking about replacement value like we have today. It would be a certain amount of agreed compensation. If it was enough, fine, but usually it wouldn't be. Night fires were a particular threat to public buildings where they could spread unnoticed. People never had smoke alarms in their houses. If you had a dog, the dog usually woke you up. But if you didn't have a dog, you, you, chances are you weren't going to wake up. Um, nighttime, you just, it's a visibility thing. You can't see what's going on. And there are all, all kinds of obstacles when you're approaching the fire that you have to uh, watch out for. And, and I was up on the roof. It was a tin roof, the building. I remember I had rubber gloves on. And I thought, uh, oh, there must be grease there. It was really slippery. And I, I realized that uh, the fire was underneath the tin where I, I was standing on the roof and uh, my gloves were melting uh, from the heat. On April 3rd, 1890, a night fire burned down Markdale's elementary school and threatened a nearby Anglican church as well as Ansley Methodist Church across the street. Years later, in December 1905, that same Methodist church was turned into what the headline called nothing but bleak walls and blackened ruins. It could have spread to the whole block because there wasn't proper fire separations between buildings. They can go from roof to roof to roof and wipe out entire blocks. Even today, this possibility often creates the perfect storm. Probably nine out of ten calls that we get of structure fires are in the nighttime. It just seems to be that's the way it is. The wind is our scariest thing we have to deal with. Wind gusts come and it'll take a barn that's barely burning and a little wind gust and they'll take it into full involved in minutes. And it can hamper the firefighters, blow the smoke in the wrong direction. And I've seen it switch directions on us sometimes. By the 19th and early 20th centuries, towns began initiating fire brigades. However, villages still relied on local citizens to respond to a fire, most often alerted by a fire bell in a church steeple. However, with buckets, hoses, and hand pumps, there was only so much they could do. If there was a fire, it was your neighbors that kind of helped. And I think a lot of the houses had special buckets hanging that you could talk about the bucket brigade, uh, and people had their own buckets and they'd bring it, and usually there's a water source nearby. Sometimes it was just too little too late. And if the fire's gonna consume this building no matter what we do, no matter how much water we put on it, then we wanna make sure it doesn't get any worse. Especially years ago when we had lack of water supply and equipment, you would concentrate your efforts on protecting things nearby. If the building is already a complete loss, and we have three buildings, so an A, B, and C building, uh, we want it, and B is on fire, 
but it's already complete loss. We want to protect building A and C. That becomes our priority. The first decades of the 20th century saw fire brigades in towns as well as villages better organized, trained, and equipped. 1905, Eugenia's Brigade, headed by Fire Chief Hollenbeck and Deputy Chief Smith, saves the Methodist Church. 1919, Markdale boasts a 25-member volunteer force with a ladder brigade, a hose brigade, and a hydrant manager. Motorized fire equipment meant getting to the fire sooner. Eventually they got a, a pumper truck that could boost the pressure as well. If you could get there soon enough that you could hit it with a good blast of water, then you may save the structure. When a fire happens, everybody wants human nature to go and see what's going on. A hindrance to the operations of the fire brigade was the way the crowd pressed in upon them. It would affect our operations and what we were trying to do. We had a plan. They were just trying to do whatever they thought they could do. Um, sometimes in, back in the day, if the fire department showed up, they may have three or four guys and bystanders may have been put on a hose line because they just, you know, we needed help. Sometimes the, the onlookers and bystanders could be a benefit, but most times they're not. They just get in the way. There's been a lot of fires that we've had and we're like, you're gonna lose the house. It's in the walls. We can't get to it. It's in too many spots. What do you want out of your house? So we'll go to the, the owners and say, what can we do to help you? Is there something in there we can get out of the house for you? We're gonna do it within reason, but you know, if there's some family heirlooms or some grandma's kitchen table or something, we will do that. Fire halls were eventually built to house the new fire brigades. Built in 1913 and in use until 1997, this was where veteran firefighter Dave Swieger started. And it had a, a hose drying tower and with a bell in the top and there was an old siren on the top. Somebody had told me it had been uh, one that had been used in London during the Second World War. I can't prove that. But it sounded pretty hauntingly like those sirens. It was a, a pulley system, and you just basically put the, the hose on and used a rope to uh, pull it up to uh, dry it. And, and uh, if it came off the pulley, there was a, a wood ladder that you would have to climb up to uh, <laughs> this old rickety wood ladder <laughs> to uh, fix the rope. Flesherton's fire hall was more modest and was in use until a new hall was built in 1983. And when I say old, it was old. <laughs> like space, construction space heaters just so the trucks didn't freeze and, and you know, yeah, it was, it was something. Early fire brigades struggled with equipment as well as health and safety. And they had no breathing apparatus and they're expected to go fight a fire. Um, and it just, they weren't prepared for it. Uh, the old breathing apparatus was not positive pressure. If you were breathing more air than was available in the mask, uh, you'd be sucking air in around the where the seal is on your face and getting the toxic fumes in. And your equipment wasn't matched for the fire. Our fire gear was a rubber raincoat, a rubber coated canvas type raincoat with no insulating factors in it whatsoever. Long coat that went down to your, just above your ankles. We had no boots. I was given basically a raincoat, a pair of hip waders, a pair of gloves and a helmet. And that was it. It was pretty sad situation. The new, newer breathing apparatus is all positive pressure. It supplies pressure inside the mask all the time so that there's more pressure in the mask than outside, not allowing the toxic fumes to come in. However, adequate supply and acceptance became an early issue. Like when we started, it was like, you know, SCBAs and that, like you would, Nobody wore them. They, they were just 
that wasn't cool to where besides that we just we didn't yeah. have them you, didn't you, couple, you, maybe. You, you might have 20 guys and you'd have two or three scbas and nobody ever wanted to wear them because you sh shared the mask <laughs> yeah. and yeah. if you didn't have a an, an air pack to put on it was no big deal you just went in and you basically they used to call us smoke eaters we just go in there and you cough and hack for a couple of days and you carry on Early firefighters were often hampered by an inadequate water supply. As early as 1908, spurred by a series of downtown fires, the villages of Markdale and Kimberley sought a solution. And they had hydrants and everything hooked up in the initial town, which supplied pressurized water. Flesherton residents, however, retained their dependence on wells for water, and do so even today. Without a pressurized town water supply, firefighters need to move water from nearby sources quickly and in sufficient quantities to be able to effectively fight large structure fires. When I got on the fire department, we had one pumper that carried 500 gallons of water. You weren't long till you ran out of water. Eventually, tankers came into the picture. So all of a sudden, instead of having 500 gallons, you had 1,500. It was a big increase, but still not nearly anywhere near enough to fight a regular structure fire. So the departments throughout Gray County started adding tankers. The tanker shows up on scene, drops off a 1,500 gallon portable tank, and then they truck water back and forth, dumping water into the portable tank. In front of our hall, we have a 5,000 gallon reservoir that we can draft out of, or we can also set tankers up at the pond, and then they drive off to wherever the, the fire may be. The building code requires reservoirs for certain sizes of construction. We have in Flesherton, uh, one at the arena grounds, there's one at the high school, and there's one at the public school. In the event of a large fire at any of those three now, we can have a good continuous supply of water. It, uh, it shows the insurance companies that we can supply the water and we can supply the demand that is needed at a certain standard. So nowadays we use what is called a trimese or a siamese valve. It has three intakes and one line. So as a tanker comes in, you hook the hose in, you can have a second one come in, and then the main hose goes to your, your pumper. Now, as the tanker empties, you flip from one tanker to the next. It's the most efficient way for us to get water to the pumper. One of the biggest challenges for Flesherton firefighters was the Fawcett Funeral Home Fire in 1970. I remember at least nine municipal fire trucks. It'd be Markdale, Flesherton, Feversham, Durham, Orangeville, Shelburne. Own Sound brought their aerial truck. It had an open cab on it. So the two firefighters that came within were sitting out in the open from Own Sound to Flesherton. I'm sure they were half froze by the time they got here. I sat there for probably three or four hours thinking that I was going to go back into my house, <laughs> and I never did. They were lucky that they saved what they did. They did a good job for the lack of equipment they had. They, they did a really good job. The last 30 years have seen a revolution in the face of firefighting, and a change in the face of firefighters as well. My firefighter are just firefighters. They're not male or female or anything. They're just firefighters, and that's the way they're respected in the community nowadays. It used to be considered a, a job where you needed the muscles and everything, and they can handle the job as well as a man. Sometimes an injured patient would rather deal with a woman than they would with the man. So it's that, that's just sometimes, it's not a stereotype, it's just reality. We know that the, the chemicals that we breathe and absorb for our bodies at a fire is extremely hazardous. Once it's in your lungs, it never goes away. These brand new homes, 
they, they're they're full of glues and toxins, yeah. which yeah. And even the uh, like the the upholstery, all the furniture and everything, yeah. like it's all just so high in in uh, toxins, as as you say, and just mm -hmm. stuff that you just can't breathe in. Yeah. yeah. You know, the cars on the road now are different than they were back in the day. We have electric cars and battery cars and you know, cars made of aluminum and boron, so we need, our equipment needs to match that. Equipment has changed uh, dramatically in the fire service. We got the bunker gear and lots more SCBA and top of the line gloves, helmets, balaclavas. They're not just an old pair of rubber boots, they're, uh, they're advanced fire boots. They're designed specifically for firefighting. There's a pack pretty much for everybody on the fire department. Everybody has their own mask. They're fitted for it. They're tested every year to make sure it fits properly. So it's a real health and safety thing. The SCBAs are built into the seats. So when we get on scene, we put our SCBA on and our masks are in our hands and our helmets are hanging above the ceiling in the truck. So we have everything with us ready to go. It's just totally different ball game today. I'm not suggesting it isn't dangerous, but uh, we are much better equipped today. Gray Highland firefighters started as volunteers and still are on call 24-7. If you were having Christmas dinner, and the fire alarm went, you were gone. There was a garage here in town and uh, probably two or three of the mechanics were all in the fire department. So if a call came in and your car was on the hoist, well, you probably weren't going to get your car back that day, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that was acceptable. That was acceptable, yeah. People understood that. Sometimes the volunteers just can't make it, leaving the station shorthanded. That's where we work with all the other fire departments, mm -hmm. and they're in the same boat, so we work as a team, mm -hmm. all, all of us, to, yep. to get the job done. Ray Highlands Fire Department is closely interlinked with ambulance services and police, as well as surrounding fire services. When you call 911, they always, they always send all three of us, and depending what agency gets there first, we coordinate, okay, who's going to do what, and then nine times out of ten, it's fire is the primary, because we need to deal with the victims, go to EMS, and then becomes police, and then we, you know, we will be clear the scene accordingly. Like we had rescues at Eugenia Falls. And we don't have the equipment to deal with that, so we called in Blue Mountains Fire under mutual aid agreement to come and assist us with the high angle rescue and so on. I don't care whose fire department responds. I want the quickest fire department to get there. That's what's best for our residents. It's just, they won't care for what color truck it is or who it's coming. They want a fire truck coming as quick as possible. So it's just more efficient and better use of our resources. Like a shadow, a constant companion rides in every truck on every call. Stress. My firefighters and the firefighters of Great Highlands are my best, uh, my greatest asset. So we put more effort into our guys and girls, uh, keeping them physically in shape, but also mentally. Well, when we first started, it was basically, well, suck it up and uh, get on with it kind of thing. The fire service realized that we're losing firefighters to suicide, to alcoholism, to you know, broken marriages. Why, why is that happening? Well, they can't cope. You went home, had a couple beers, whatever, and yeah. get up the next morning and carry it on. Exactly. You know, yeah. Yeah. Right. So we spend more time, we have more resources, we'll talk about it. And if, if people need to cry, they can cry. I've cried at a, after fire calls. I don't mind crying in front of my guys because something's upset me. That's the way I will process it, and that's the way I will get it out. And if I can show that sincerity to them, then maybe that helps them feel free to come to me and talk to me. I'd rather listen to somebody for days and hours on end than have to go to a funeral for them. It showed that, you know, you don't have to be the tough guy. We can get them all the equipment so that they breathe properly and we protect them from fire, but if their brain and their mind is, and their mental health is not strong, then we fail, we, we lose them. Let no man's ghost return to say his training let him down. Training in the fire service in the earlier days was really lacking. 
Back in the day, they weren't as well as trained because they weren't equipped and we, we didn't have the resources to do that. Today, training is the absolute key to safety for both the firefighters and the people they protect. It used to always be you're a volunteer, right? It was always volunteer, you, you're not a real firefighter. My guys and girls are compared to a Toronto firefighter. It's your firefighter one, your firefighter two trained, whether you're in Markdale or Flesherton or Dundalk or Toronto. The same training and the same equipment. Flesherton and Markdale stations share two pumper trucks, three tanker trucks, a squad vehicle equipped to power lights and other equipment, and a rugged terrain vehicle capable of getting six fully equipped firefighters to a remote scene. Practicing fire safety and prevention is not limited to firefighters. We're mandated under the Fire Prevention and Protection Act to do fire prevention activities so that we have to go out and tell people how to protect themselves with smoke alarms and CO alarms and home safety plans. And our best method to do that is with the kids. Well, to get it out there to the children at the schools, they take it home, they teach the parents. So it's a, it's a really, really big, it's a key tool to fire prevention. Public education is probably the number one fire prevention thing that we could do. Uh, we will go to people's homes and ask if we can come in and just look at their for smoke detectors and their CO detectors. Are they properly installed? Do they have them where they're supposed to have them? To keep your loved ones safe, find out more about scheduling a home fire safety visit. Contact Kayla at Fire Administration. Our studies and our stats have shown that up to 70% of the houses will not be compliant. Guys get excited to put out fires, but if we can prevent fires, I'm happier. The more we can get in the community and spread the message of fire safety and fire protection, uh, the better. Because right? that keeps our community safe, it keeps our property safe, it means people aren't um, being traumatized and you know, worst case, people aren't dying. Despite our best efforts, fires still happen. There were a lot of challenges that day, to say the least, um, for the firefighters when they arrived on scene. Chapman's ice cream fire was a, it, it was emptying our water tower pretty quickly. It was because they brought up three aerial monitors pouring water on it from three sides. Despite this effort, massive sugar and chocolate silos were soon totally engulfed. And that's part of the reason why you could see the fire clearly in downtown Toronto, right? The black smoke coming from the sugar. The firefighters, they, they tried their best. Two trucks set up uh, a system running hose from the pond and then p having trucks sitting um, in different intervals between there and Chapman's to build up the pressure as, and, and keep pumping it up from there to and so that was an endless water supply we they got and they switched over from the well pumps and the water tower to the river supply on that day i would say the most important thing that 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 came out of everything that happened was that there was absolutely certainly no fatalities no injuries uh, for any of our people that was the only thing that was important to the chapman family I remember we got a call, it was out towards Woodhouse, and it was, supposed, it was supposed to be just a little grass fire. The grass literally started to burn. And the fire would be low, and then all of a sudden it would jump 20 feet in the air. It just started going, and it headed north, and uh, it went through one field, and we were literally running to st stop it. It jumped two side roads, and we couldn't get ahead of it. It was moving faster than our trucks could go up the road and, and get the water in on the field. Because the wind caught it, and the wind just took that fire in about four different directions. That was the one thing that always stood on my mind, how, how quick a fire can roll. We fight it. You have to respect it. You have to respect it. <laughs> the spirit of a, of a small town like this, when, when you're a local and you, you experience a tragedy, a tragedy like we did, it's, it, it's a really heartwarming thing to see how people react and uh, people wanted to help.
I can remember people phoning and how can we help and give you a coat and the community was absolutely phenomenal. It's, it's incredible that the community still gets together and, and I hope we never, even as our community grows, I hope we never lose that. For more than 150 years, volunteer firefighters like these have been a vital part of the fabric of Grey Highlands. Always on call, they ensure that we have life-saving protection from fire and other emergencies 24-7. But it's more than that. Volunteer firefighters and their families make our community better in many other ways, including public education and awareness, as well as fire safety events and programs. In those days, the, the kids were always involved, whether it be Santa Claus parades or car washes, whatever you were doing, the families were always there. Many children of firefighter families become firefighters themselves, continuing this noble tradition through generations. It's a family thing, so our kids, um, at that time we would uh, get the kids down to the hall and they would help clean the trucks and you know they were only five six years old and they, they were raised in it and so uh, I actually have both my boys in uh, uh, firefighting now at, at Gray Highlands. It is a long and enviable history of service and commitment to our community by close-knit professionals that continues to this day to enrich the life the spirit and the safety of Gray Highlands. I used to go up to the fire station there and sit up in the little pumper they had there. It was an open cab, Rio, I believe, and uh, just dream about being a firefighter. I'm doing something practical all the time as a service to the community. Firefighters are a close-knit bunch, there's no question about it. And uh, the comradeship in firefighting is great. It's just being part of the team and doing the right thing 